Will you pray with me, please? Amen. Father God, we come to you this evening just giving you thanks, honor, and praise for another day that you blessed us with. Another day that you allowed us to see and a day that we saw friends, family, and others. We just ask you, God, that as we go forth in this study, that you just open our minds and open our hearts so that we understand the truths that are brought out by this gospel. God, that this gospel informs us about your goodness, your love, your grace, your mercy, and we can share that with all of those who are just willing to hear, just so that we can be ambassadors for you, oh God, because we love you so much. We just ask you, God, that as we go forth, that our learning, God, is complete, where there is no, uh, there is always clarity and there is no confusion. And we just ask, God, that as others come in, that they can just join in and it just works well and the discussion is awesome. We just pray that in your mighty son, Jesus name. And will all the saints of God say, amen. 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 So obviously we always start with a recap. Mm -hmm. So let us get forth in those questions. And it says in Matthew 21, Jesus tells a parable about two sons. Tell me a little bit about each of those sons. Remember, there were two sons, and he owned a vineyard, a plot of land. And tell me a little bit about what the first son did. When the he father said, asked, go ahead. Mm -hmm. The first son said that he would um, do what the father asked him to do, but he did mm -hmm. not make any effort to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, remember, he, he that, had the first son. Oh, that, that, was, was, a that was the second son. That's the second son. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> yeah. the, the first one the first one said, no, he wasn't going to do it, but he did do it. Yeah. Got you. <laughs> Thank oh, you, Sister Susan. <laughs> and, and we got the answer for the second. Thank you, Sister Henry. And thank you, Sister <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you definitely did. So you're correct. The first son, basically, the father said, hey, I need to go work on the land. And he was like, you know what? I'm not going at all. But then his <laughs> conscience got to him, and he did go and do what his father had asked. And then the second son, you remember, he was the one that was really respectful. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, I'll sir. go. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Laying it on thick, as we say. <laughs> and he stayed <laughs> right in the house in the air condition. So, <laughs> so needless to say, obviously, we get the brunt of that story. And that actually leads to uh, question two, where it says, why would tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before the priests and elders. Remember, it's the summation of that parable. Why is that? Because they repent. Correct. Exactly, exactly. You got it. Remember, we the example was the first son who said, no, I'm not going to go. But obviously, he had that prick in his heart. And we say the Holy Spirit touched him. And he went out and did what he needed to do. That repentant spirit to say, you know what? I was wrong for that. Let me do what my father said. Mm -hmm. And we know that the priests and the elders, they were all about themselves, you know, mm -hmm. all about lacing their pockets, all about keeping that political power. Exactly. So this question, there was a piece I was trying to get out, but the PowerPoint was acting funky. So it shouldn't say the tenants in the parable. It should say basically uh, that piece where it says in the parable about the vineyard owner, the tenants were happy to see the landowner's son when he arrived. This is true or false. They respected the son very much. Oh, oh. oh wow. so tell me, <laughs> what, what did they want to do? They wanted to kill him. They wanted to kill him and did, right? Yeah. <laughs> they killed him and tried to take his inheritance. Exactly. <laughs> so yes, no, they didn't respect him at all. At all. So the last one for our recap question is, true or false? The chief priests were happy with the parables Jesus told in Matthew 20. <laughs> False. False. <laughs> <laughs> and why weren't they happy? <laughs> what, what, what were they, when did they find out what, what Jesus was really doing? Yeah, they, they knew he was talking about them and they were offended. <laughs> <laughs> he was talking about them. So, of course, they were upset and they were trying to do everything they could, but they were afraid of the people. So, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, good deal, good deal. So, now let us go forth. And we ended on this study question, actually with the commentary prior to it. So I wanted to make sure we at least addressed it in tonight's study. In study question 5C, it says, what do we learn from the parable of the wedding feast? 
Remember that that parable that Jesus told about the rich man, very rich man, actually, basically, yeah. that spoke about his son getting married and yeah. he asked people to come. And then he even, you know, compelled them, said, you know, I got all this good food, a fat lean calf. I have all these great things. Come on. And remember, people were like, no, I can't go. You know, this person right. had to do this. And then some of them, he took his servants and beat them up and killed them, right? So right. he, right. You know, he right. sent the army out and got rid of them. Yeah. Said, Let's restart this. I want you to go and compel the good and the bad. Make sure uh -huh. you go bring them all in. And then, of course, they come all in. And then there was basically one particular man that did he was not dressed appropriately. Remember, obviously, he got cast out. So we're saying, what did we learn from that parable? What was that parable? What was Jesus trying to teach us? But he was, uh, the wedding is uh, us <laughs> and Jesus. <laughs> and, and the fact that though the invitation is open mm. and those that uh, were initially invited didn't come. Mm -hmm. And at the, uh, so it was opened up to everyone else also. Exactly. No, what you're saying. Remember, he started out with that. The kingdom of God is like. Right. Remember, you always right. kind of put those, those pieces out, and you're exactly right. Basically, that open invitation. You got those that reject it. So now we're, it's open to everyone. everyone. Come on in. Remember, he said good and bad. Did not differentiate because just like we saw in that repentance piece, those people that we consider bad, those harlots and those tax collectors, if they turn, change their life around and go to God, they are just <laughs> like those who hadn't done things like that or have done worse things. Right. That. So that's exactly it. So let us go with that answer. And I actually borrowed it from, um, I actually got some more commentary. Sorry. So let's actually just read uh, the comment, more commentary on the wedding feast from Dot Question. Will someone read that book, please? To summarize the point of the parable of the wedding feast, God sent his son into the world and they and the very people who should have celebrated his coming rejected him bringing judgment upon themselves as a result the kingdom of heaven was opened up to anyone who will set aside his own righteousness and by faith accept the righteousness god provides in christ those who spurn the gift of salvation and cling instead to their own good works will spend eternity in hell the self-righteous Pharisees who heard this parable did not miss Jesus's point. In the very next verse, the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. Matthew, the 22nd chapter, 15th verse. The parable of the wedding feast is also a warning to us to make sure we're relying on God's provision of salvation, not our own good works or religious service. Mm, I got mm. it. So basically kind of brings that piece home to give us an understanding there. Yeah. So but oh, now I'm questions pastor, about that. Yes, ma'am. A uh, pastor. Now um I'm so I forgot what this the significance of the man who was not dressed appropriately uh was. Was it that he, right. he didn't have yeah. the right attitude? Right. So basically he came with the form to go in, but he didn't have he what yeah, exactly was the attitude one hundred percent that he want didn't okay. He wanted the good, good things that God provides, but he didn't want to give himself totally to God. Oh, okay. I didn't want to dress appropriately. I want okay. to just eat your fatling calf. I want to enjoy your, your, your wine and all, but I'm not giving my heart to you in essence. So basically okay. that form, but not truly that uh, the whole, as we say, the whole enchilada. <laughs> okay. So with that said, Obviously, I like I said, I borrowed it actually from God questions because I thought it was said so perfectly. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that piece that we read, just because we see that the point of it is that God sent his son into the world. Obviously, he invited people that should have come to celebrate, but they rejected him. Of course, they did receive their judgment. You know, the big, the big ones that did obviously were killed. Remember, he had the army go out after them. But then because of that, obviously, everything is opened up. And remember, these parables were kind of saying, remember, when Jesus came, obviously, he said, I came, obviously, for more so for the Jewish people. Remember, we had Gentiles right. come in and say that. So basically, that first part of the parable were, we invited all these Jewish people to come, but they didn't want to have anything to do with it. 
So now, you know what? Everybody come on down, you know? So this opened it up to us, the Gentile, you know? So now we can have a seat at the table, obviously going to the table correctly, not just going to get what God can have and not giving ourselves to him, but giving our all to him, coming dressed appropriately so we can definitely uh, sup on the good things that he has for us uh, in the kingdom to come and, of course, in the kingdom that is here. Does it make sense? Yes. Yes. Cool, cool. All righty. So now we're going to go on to Matthew, the 22nd chapter, verses 15 through 17. And will someone please read for us that piece of scripture? Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Mm -hmm. They said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? I tell you, it always seems that as we get closer and closer to Christ getting toward that cross, maybe we see all of these people coming at him and attack, him, you know, so we see now the Pharisees lay out plans to trap him, but they sent their disciples along with the Herodians. So I definitely, obviously, you know, if there's a road, a, 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 something in red, we're definitely going to go deeper into <laughs> it. I don't want that to be glanced over. <laughs> so let us talk a little bit about who are the Herodians. Will someone please read for us uh, that commentary from God Questions? At the time of Jesus, there were certain groups, the Pharisees, the Herodians, and the Sadducees that held positions of authority and power over the people. Other groups were the Sanhedrin, the scribes, and the lawyers. Each of these groups held power in either religious or political matters. The Herodians held political power, and most scholars believe that they were a political party that supported King Herod uh, Antipas. The Roman Empire's ruler over much of the land of the Jews from 4 BC to AD 39. The Herodians favored submitting to the Herods and therefore to Rome for political expediency. This support of Herod compromised Jewish independence in the minds of the Pharisees, making it difficult for the Herodians and the Pharisees to unite and agree on anything. <laughs> but one thing did unite them, opposing Jesus. Mm. Herod himself <laughs> wanted Jesus dead, Luke 13 and 31. And the Pharisees had already hatched plots against him, John 11. Uh, verse 53. So they joined efforts to achieve their common goal. Mm -hmm. The Pharisees, oh, I guess we're getting some feedback. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, so basically, we see where the Pharisees are uh, joining forces with these Herodians, which basically just are political arm, just the political party, you know, basically attached to Herod. And of course, Herod was in essence attached to Rome. So it was basically them trying to keep power and to gain power in that aspect. So let's just keep going and talk about this group, the Herodians. The first appearance of the Herodians in scripture is Mark 3, 6. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Jesus had been doing miracles, which caused some of the people to believe in him for salvation. And that threatened the power and position of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians. The Herodians again joined with the Pharisees to challenge Jesus to see if they could trap Jesus in his words by a trick question to either discredit him or to get him to stop preaching, Matthew 22, 16. Mm -hmm. So we see basically just, of course, how the plot thickens when all of these people try to come together to stop the master. Mm -hmm. Let us uh, just continue with the end of that uh, commentary. Will someone please read? Jesus regarded the two groups as in unity against him and warned his followers against them. Be careful, Jesus warned. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. 
Mark 8, chapter the 15th verse. Yeast in this context, context is false teaching. The rejection of Jesus as the Messiah and hypocrisy. Many scholars believe that the Herodian, Herodians mm -hmm. look to Herod as a <clears throat> Messiah, a savior of sorts, who would put the Jewish land in favor with the Roman Empire and bring blessings to them. Jesus' pre presentation of himself as the Messiah was a threat to the Herodians and, uh, it, excuse me, a threat to the Herodians' attempt to make Herod the influential political power in the land. Mm, so we see basically a religious groups coming together, political arms coming together, because everybody wanted their power. So, and they saw the power of Christ and the majesty of Christ, and they were like, oh no, we got to stop this. So basically just wanted you to have an understanding of them because we don't hear that. We hear about scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees, yeah, but Herodians, we don't really hear much about, even though they were part of this story uh, too as well. <laughs> so just wanted to put a thought question out there. <laughs> Just wanted to ask, what do you think about mixing religion with politics? Hmm. <laughs> Just a question. What, what do you think about it? Well, world has a saying they don't make good bed partners. <laughs> <Gotcha>. <laughs> but there should be a certain amount, I think, a certain amount of religion in politics if, if we're going to have leaders that are going to be fair and honest. Mm -hmm. I got you. I got you. Uh, yeah. I believe in that. Yes. So, if they follow it, the ten, if they follow the rules of the Bible, mm -hmm. beginning right? It's 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 a slippery right. slope, you know. Because yeah. basically, right. we see that obviously you want the Christian leader one hundred percent because he or she will know who God is, and obviously, in the problems that we have here on planet Earth, they will be able to consult him, so they make the wise and the right decision. But you also have those who also jockey for power too as well and use that guise. I mean, there was a lot of people that said they'll hold their Bible up and say, yes, I came, you know, I'm liking it. And, and I always promised myself uh, when I was in, when I get into leadership, when I was view these things, of course, because we all, I can say have been in the black church for a while. And we know when political, <laughs> political season comes around, everybody comes on down, you know yeah. what I mean? And, one of the worst oh, yeah. things I saw with that is basically uh, a pastor had allowed someone to, you know, speak during the announcements and they kind of took it over. And after that, you know, they gave their stance and then they just walked out to church, you know? <laughs> so in my mindset, I said, if, if God ever calls me to do this, <laughs> I am not having that. <laughs> just because right. <laughs> in my opinion, I, I don't mind politicians coming to the church. They'll be welcome because everybody is welcome in the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. right. However, when you're ready to give your political stance, that's going to be after services are concluded. Because right. the Smart. focus of this house <laughs> is worship. So right. right. If you want Amen. to worship with us, Amen. If you want to enjoy the service. Hey, by all means, I want you to believe me, that actually gives me more respect for you instead mm -hmm. of you trying to give your political message and walk out. Right. Than me. Right. That, right. I was like, I, I would never vote for him. <laughs> right. <laughs> that attitude was like, you're so much better. I got to hit every black church on the on the on the road. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I get it, and so that's why I say it, it's difficult because obviously we want that right leader, but I think it's just prayerfully when you vote. You know, you just definitely pray about who is going to be in leadership over us because unfortunately we have people who come with the best intentions sometimes, but still get swayed. <laughs> yeah. Yes, true. And Pastor, that's one of those times that they speak one thing, but their actions show a total different thing. Amen. <laughs> Amen. 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 Like I say, just because you carry a Bible in and you have church speak, don't mean you know Jesus, you know? <laughs> so, Amen. So the right. idea is, I, I definitely want someone who knows him, especially in governance, you know, because obviously, as you see, when we don't have those types of folks, how things happen. <laughs> That's it. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to bring that up because obviously we have that same issue now and they had it back then. Obviously, we see the Herodians, we see all of these religious guys organizations but basically were more political arms that were kind of jockeying for power not necessarily a true uh understanding the truth obviously because if they did they would have accepted christ jesus mm -hmm. uh, other thoughts other quite other comments 
No. It, um, it okay. made me think about a, a commercial that used to run on CNN where you had the two political parties sitting on a on a bench and th and they were separated and and then a uh, a combination a half elephant half donkey came <laughs> up and they were they were laughing at him and he asked if there was any room in the middle and they said no and they and they, and they, and they moved together it's like uh, it's in camp it's camps it, it truly yeah is. that's right yeah the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend yeah. <laughs> and that's as you see the sadducees the pharisees the herodians Believe that because uh, right. they themselves mm -hmm. didn't like each they other. They have a common enemy. <laughs> exactly, mm -hmm. exactly, exactly. The good deal. Just wanted to kind of stir the pot, get the mind going with that, because obviously in tonight's uh, the, what we're studying tonight, a lot of that mix we're going to see. So just wanted to kind of get that out. So let us actually do commentary specifically on the scripture uh, that we that we read, which is verses uh, Matthew twenty-two verses fifteen to seventeen. Will somebody please read that scriptural commentary? Plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. Here the Pharisees and the Herodians worked together. This was evidence of their this was evidence of their great hatred of Jesus because they were willing to put aside their own differences for the sake of uniting against Jesus. We know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. <laughs> Their plotting led them to approach Jesus with flattery. They hoped he was, he was insecure or foolish enough to be impressed by their hollow praise. <laughs> Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Jesus' dilemma with this question was simple. If he said that taxes should be paid, he could be accused of denying the sovereignty of God over Israel, making himself unpopular with the Jewish people. If he said taxes should not be paid, he made himself an enemy of Rome. Hmm. So obviously we see basically, as the commentator says, we see basically they were trying to get him entangled. And I like this piece where here where it says they tried to kind of do it with flattery. And even though that person who really wants to kind of ask you a direct question, but they come indirectly and to get there, they say, oh, man, you look so nice today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How's your yeah. son doing? The one they know is in jail. You know, <laughs> you know it, it's kind of those type of and that's how they were coming. They, it was with mm -hmm. malintent. It was to gather information. It was to kind of show out in front of uh, show, uh, you know, get a trap, for lack of a better word. So we see mm -hmm. that. And I love how the commentary said they hope that he was insecure or foolish enough. Well, we know he's God Almighty. He knew exactly yeah. <laughs> what they did. He knew that that was just very hollow because they didn't like him at all. <laughs> so, right. so why would they, you know, praise him and say, oh, you're so great, and then present these questions to him? So, yeah, definitely it. Uh, will someone please uh, continue reading the scripture, uh, Matthew, the 22nd chapter, verses 18 through 22. But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him the Daenerys, and he asked them, Whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. Mm -hmm. We see basically Jesus calling them out, you know, yes. basically calling out their evil intent. It's, it, it's one of those things. Usually he kind of kept it and just kind of said a parable. But at this time, he's like, you know what? You're trying to trap me. <laughs> so come, you know, come here. You know, like he's frustrated. He's like, give me this, give me the coin, you know, and shows them the coin. And obviously says that great thing that we quote all the time. Give back what, give what Caesar's is Caesar's and what God is God's. So, mm -hmm. uh, Amen. so let's just get some commentary with that. Will someone please read? Whose image and inscription is this? Again, with his wise <laughs> answer, Jesus showed that he was in complete control. He rebuked the wickedness and hypocrisy of the Pharisees and Herodians. Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Jesus affirmed that the government makes legitimate requests of us. 
We are responsible to God in all things, but we must be obedient to government in matters civil and national, and to God the things that are God's. Everyone has the image of God impressed upon them. This means that we behold to God not to Caesar or not even to ourselves. Mm. Uh, uh, belong. I said behold. We belong no, no to God. Yes. Sorry. No, you're pro no problem at all. Uh, I just love that, that the piece in the commentary basically talking about that see what Caesar's is Caesar's, and of course affirming what God is God's, because basically we do fall, follow the laws of the land, you know, basically. Right. Obviously, we're not going to do anything that is against our Christian faith, you know, but basically, yes, we still have laws that we are governed by, you know, obviously there are speed limits. We can't say, oh, I'm a Christian. I'm going to go 45. And they say, you can say that and you'll be a Christian in jail. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> For real. <laughs> I mean, so there are things that we have. And basically Jesus was giving us that separation. You know, basically spiritual things are spiritual. Earth things are earth, you know. So right. we're kind of getting that separation piece. So definitely, uh, I thought it was a neat way as he put in that civil and national matters as far as government. Right. Any other thoughts at all before yeah. we go forward? Because we saw earlier where Jesus paid tax. Amen. Amen. He got the, the money out of the fish head. Was it Matthew? Or yes, it, that's exactly. It was in previous count. Remember when he right. and so, I called him. Oh, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, no. So, I mean, so he he is taking care of whatever the, uh, you know, as far as the things that are required. Mm -hmm on the earthly plane, you know, to, you got to honor the, the laws of the land, as mm -hmm. long as they don't com conflict with his teachings or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, so he pays taxes like everybody else. Amen. Amen. And, and, it, and like we said, the funny part, remember, we we're looking at that scripture is that was his house, you know, <laughs> so, right. <laughs> obviously, <laughs> yeah. but he still honored that piece to keep that tradition. Remember? So that's why he said, you know, go catch a fish and boom, the money that was needed for him and his disciple was there and they paid right. the, the temple tax. So, yeah, you're very right about it. He still honored those laws, even though he was God. And it's just it's, it's so awesome when I see that just because. It lets me know that people say, well, he didn't, he, Jesus don't understand. No, he understands it all because he's done it all. He's paid. Mm -hmm. He's had to, you know, mm -hmm. off of a friend. He's had all these things happen to him. So that's why he could take on all of it for us because he, he knows us he intimately. Does. So it, it's, just, right. it's, it's just awesome. It's, it's good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So let, let's, let's keep going. All right. Well, someone, oh, sorry. I think we're, there we go. Will someone please read the commentary? Whose image and inscription is this? Again, with his wise answer, Jesus showed that he was in complete control. He rebuked the wickedness and hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the Herodians. Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Jesus affirmed that the government makes legitimate requests of us. We are responsible to God in all things, but we must be obedient to government in matters civil and national, and to God the things that are God's. Everyone has the image of God impressed upon them. This means that we belong to God, not to Caesar, or not even to ourselves. I tell you, I apologize that we had already done that, but we can also say I thank you, and I guess this really needed to be learned. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Amen. All righty, now let's go to our study question uh, 1D. And it says, with what question did the Pharisees seek to trap Jesus? <laughs> Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar mm -hmm. or not? Yeah, there we go. You said it. Tell us this in your opinion. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? They ask, is it right to pay the imperial tax, of course, to Caesar or not? Yeah. Yes, it's right. <laughs> All right, let's go forth. Next, to study question 2D. What do we owe Caesar? Render to Caesar what is his. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to get deeper in that, and you're right, definitely. I wanted this to get a little further commentary to kind of bring it home with that. So it's further commentary on that very fact, looking at Matthew, the 22nd chapter and verse 18 through 22 and got questions. Will someone please read that for us? Jesus responses, nothing short of brilliant. But Jesus, 
but Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why put me to the test? You hit you hypocrites, show me the coin for the text. And they brought him a Daenerys, Matthew 22, 18, 19, ESV. The Daenerys, the Daenerys was a coin used as the tax money at the time. It was made of silver and featured an image of the imperial with an inscription calling him divine. The Jews considered such images idol tree. Forbidden by the second commandment, this was another reason why if Jesus answered, yes, he would be in trouble. Mm -hmm. His acceptance of the text was lawful, could have been seen as a rejection of the second commandment, thus casting doubt on his claim to be the son of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. with the coin displayed in front of them, Jesus said, Whose likeness is, and the inscription is this. The Herodians and the Pharisees stayed in the obvious, said Caesar's. Then Jesus brought an end to their foolish tricks. Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Matthew, the 22nd chapter, 21st verse. He, upon hearing this, Jesus' enemies marveled and went away. Verse 22. <laughs> then when Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, he was drawing a sharp distinction between two kingdoms. There is a kingdom of this world, and Caesar hold, holds power over it. But there is another kingdom, not of this world, and Jesus is the king of that, John 18 and 36. Christians are part of both kingdoms, at least temporarily. Under Caesar, we have certain obligations that involve material things. Under Christ, we have other obligations that involve eternal thing, things eternal. If Caesar demands money, give it to him. It is only mammon. But make sure you also give God what he demands. So I do enjoy this commentary, but the one piece, and like I said, I, where I'm going to just draw a contrast with the writer is basically he said that uh, Caesar, of course, is the power and of this world. And then, of course, Jesus power of, you know, the world to come. But mm -hmm. to me, Jesus is powerful over all of them. Oh, he just has the allowance right. for Caesar to do what he does or the people in government. So that's that was my, my, my little gripe with the commentator. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't think that to, to me, the way it was written, and it might have not been his uh, intention, is the fact that it seems like the men own this world. You know what I mean? And God owns this world, but God owns all of it. You know, like I said, he is the one who created it. And he is the one who created the people who are, of course, in government and in leadership. So just wanted to bring that out. So I didn't want that to be confusing because it kind of sounded one way or the other when it, when it was read. <laughs> Any questions? All right. Mm -hmm. So now, as uh, Sister Avery said, answers the study question 2D. We're informed to render to Caesars what is what Caesar's? Is Caesar's? Yep, yep, yep. And let us go forth. So now we're going into uh, another piece of Matthew, the 22nd chapter, the 23rd through the 28th verses. And will someone please read that for us? That, that same, same, go ahead. No, that same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for him. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and third brother, right down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven, since all of them were married to her? Mm. <laughs> First off, uh, on his face, this is kind of ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's either putting some poison in their food or, <laughs> or something is wrong. The <laughs> black widow. She's exactly. a black widow. <laughs> Exactly. So obviously we see the ridiculousness of them trying to just trap him in this, yes, you know. Yes. So, but obviously, so the last time we talked about the Pharisees and the Herodians, now we're talking about the Sadducees. Sadducees. Of course, we see it in red, obviously, especially, and I wanted this because 
It says Sadducees who said there is no resurrection. That was meant to be, to really be there and to draw sharp contrast because we see that they're not believers anyway. You know what I mean? So why would right. you come and approach with this? So let us dig deeper and look at some commentary on the Sadducees. Will someone please read who are the Sadducees and what did they believe coming from Christianity.com? In first century Israel, Sadducees were a religious faction that wielded society, uh, social, societal power in nearly every aspect except military. And for that, they had the backing of their Roman benefit factors. These were the Jewish arts aristocrats of their day, known as much for their wealth and corruption as for their religious devotion. Mm, okay, so basically we see that they are a religious faction, obviously, that had societal power in everything but military in the Jewish system. And obviously they were in pockets with Rome too as well. We see every political wing wanted to have access to Rome, obviously, because they were the governing body of the known world at that time. But we have some more about them. Beliefs of the Sadducees. Will someone please read that for us? And I should say Christianity.com. <laughs> I show emphasis on the first five books of Moses, the Torah. They believed the Bible. Our Old Testament was the only authority on matters of faith and life. Sadducees flatly rejected the Pharisees, teaching that oral tradition was equal to scripture in authority. They believed in unre unrestrained free will, meaning God had no role in the personal lives of humans. Mm -hmm. Everyone was master of his or her own destiny. Sadducees rejected entirely the supernatural refuting belief in angels, demons, heaven, hell, and resurrection. To their way of thinking, souls die with the bodies, the end. Despite the previous, they believed strongly in ritual purity as prescribed by Moses. They didn't want anything to disqualify them from leading the temple services that generated income. Mm -hmm. so we wow. see the Sadducees were very bizarre individuals <laughs> in, the, in the fact that they truly had the guise of holiness, the idea of holiness, but they used that for capital gains, not for spiritual enlightenment. In the fact that they wanted to be part of the temple, they wanted to, you know, do the purification. They wanted to bring in the right animals and show who they were, but they were really doing it to more to get power and to line their pockets. And we also see their belief system, which is very unique, because obviously they all were part of the children of Israel who were released from Egypt, who saw all of these great wonders and all these feasts are celebrated because of it. But they had no belief in the resurrection, no belief in angels, no belief in demons, not heaven and hell. They basically thought that the earth was your home and after you died, there was nothing, you know, so... But still, they went and served God at the temple. Just it, 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 it seems so disjointed, you know, but it yeah, was really. fully a power move. It was all about having power, you know, but they had this guise of it. So they're very unique. And that's why I, want, I wanted to look deep into them because they just, truth be told, on their face, don't really make much sense. <laughs> you know? The Pharisees, I can understand to a point in the fact that obviously they looked, uh, of course, believed in the supernatural things and what God did and how he brought them through. But these group, not at all, not at all. So very <laughs> unique, very, very unique. And that's why in the scripture, it says the Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection. resurrection. So they mm. were saying, I, they're already discounted. So ask your question, you know what I mean? <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. That's what we kind of see. Does it make sense? Any questions about this, the belief statements or anything on the Sadducees? Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So uh, let's, uh, let's continue uh, with some commentary about the scripture itself. And uh, will someone please read that for us? Uh, Matt, for coming, looking into Matthew, the 22nd chapter, verses 23 through 28. The Sadducees who say there is no resurrection, 
The Sadducees were the ancient version of the modern liberal theologians. They were anti-supernaturalistic, only accepting the first five books of Moses as authentic and disregarding what was written in those books when it pleased them to do so. Now there were, now there were with mm. us seven brothers. The Sadducees asked Jesus a hypothetical and ridiculous question, <laughs> hoping to show that the idea of the resurrection is nonsense. Based on Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10, if a married man died childless, it was his brother's responsibility to impregnate his, impregnate his brother's widow and then count the child as the deceased husband's descendant. The Pharisees imagined elaborate circumstances along these lines and raised the question, therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? Mm, so we see that. And we see a further this craziness, because basically we see that as this author, uh, I mean, as this commentator says, obviously, they only accepted the first five books of Moses as authentic. authentic. And we have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Yeah. In Genesis, what are the first line? In the beginning, in the beginning God created. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it, it, it's ridiculous on its face, but they were existing and they were a powerful group. You know what I mean? And obviously, they had backers and followers. So yes, very unique, very very unique. <laughs> and I like that the statement where it says disregarding what was written when it pleased them to do so. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> totally yeah. negate. I mean, Genesis. If they not, you know, it totally it's. It's just wild. <laughs> <laughs> well, will someone please continue to read? You are mistaken. The Sadducees connected their thoughts to a biblical passage, but did not think through the passage correctly. These highly trained men were mistaken in their basic understanding of biblical truth. Not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God, their mistake was rooted in two causes. <laughs> First, they did not know the scriptures, though they thought they did. Second, they did not know the power of God. Being basically anti-supernaturalist, they were, this was true of them, even though the religion was their career and they were highly trained. Mm. Mm. I think that really sums up at that, that end or sums up that group. Because basically we see the religion was a career. <laughs> this was a job. This was yeah. getting money. This was making money. And there's no belief that was attached to it at all. Basically was that that idea of just employment, you know, so and we have that. I mean, we have that basically uh, we can see that even in some religious institutions where we have people that are doing things that are just it's just a job. You know what I mean? When you ask their belief states, you're like, oh, wow. You know, you didn't really understand it. They, they actually told me in seminary, they say you. You don't find God in seminary. You learn of him in seminary, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. there are people that teach you that their belief system is very Sadducee-like and even beyond, you know, but you basically are just learning these things, you know, while you're in, in that training. So, yeah, definitely very interesting. Very, very interesting. <laughs> now, the, oh, the, the Sadducees, um, the, the Pharisees were the ones that actually were responsible for like interpreting the laws, right? Or was right. it both? So, well, you had actually different concepts because you actually had true lawyers uh, that were part of it. Remember when Jesus went to the house of the lawyer, you know, you had them. So you also had the, the why you hear the Pharisees pieces because their belief faction was just beyond those five books. But they also believed in creation. They believed in the demons. They believed in the angels. So obviously in that law piece, they incorporated that. But you had a lot of just true law people, i.e. lawyers that were giving that interpretation as well. And like I said, basically the big differences between them is more so the beliefs because they all, truth be told, dabble in the law, you know, to be honest with you. Did they clear it up? Did it make sense or? Yeah, okay. thank you. Now, will someone please continue in the commentary? Not knowing the scriptures, it is possible for a person to have much Bible knowledge, yet not fundamentally know the scriptures. 
Paul later told Timothy to hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. This suggests that biblical truth has a pattern to it, a pattern that can be detected by the discerning heart. It also suggests that one can lose this pattern, thus the command to hold fast. The Sadducees had Bible knowledge, but they did not hold fast the pattern of sound words. Many today are like them in this respect, nor the power of God. The Sadducees did not have <laughs> natural truths, such as the existence of angelic beings and the bodily uh, resurrection. They had a fundamental doubt of the power of God to do beyond what they could measure and understand in the material world. Many today are like the Sadducees in this respect. Mm -hmm. So it leads us to study question 1E. And it says, with what question did the Sadducees <laughs> seek to trap Jesus? Because remember, we had Pharisees, Herodians, their question. And then what was the Sadducees' very unique question? If there was a woman in who was married and the husband died, the brother had to marry, take on the responsibility, and she went through seven of them. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And, and uh, who, I guess that truly who, represents a number of completion. In that. <laughs> that yeah, like, mm. yeah. <laughs> so yes, exactly. And that's pretty much the answer. They asked whose wife a woman would be if she had been married to seven different brothers. Yeah. Everybody got it? Okay. Now let's get forward uh, in Matthew, looking at verses uh, 29 through 33, still staying in the 22nd, excuse me, the 22nd chapter. Will someone please read? Jesus replied, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowd heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Hmm. So I, I like this piece because it shows kind of, in my opinion, it's no disrespect to the master, but Jesus is getting raw with him. You know what I mean? Basically, yeah. saying, you know, uh, yeah. you're in error. <laughs> so you don't know what you're talking about. You know, basically, mm -hmm. you're in error because first off, you don't understand that uh, the, the script, what the scriptures say, or the power of God. And he basically says at the resurrection, obviously we will not be married or be given into marriage, but we'll be like the angels who are in heaven. And of course, he gets deeper into that understanding and says, of course, when the crowds heard this, they were astonished. So let us go forth in some commentary to discuss this. Will someone please read? In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. First, Jesus reminded them that life in the resurrection is quite different from this life. It does not merely continue this world and its arrangements, but it is life of a completely different order. This passage has made many wonder if marriage relationships will exist in heaven, or if those who are husband and wife on earth will have no special relationship in heaven. We are not told enough about life in the world beyond to answer in great detail but we can understand a few principles. Family relationships will still be known in life in the world beyond. The rich man Jesus described in the afterlife was aware of his family relationships. Luke 27 20, and 28, I'm sorry, Luke 16, chapter 27, 28. The glory of heaven will be a relationship and connection with God that surpasses anything else including present family relationships, Revelations 21st chapter, 22nd and 23rd verses. Mm. So basically we see this kind of a breakdown in giving us that understanding about 
what we uh, what we're gathering and what we're extrapolating what life will be like in heaven. And obviously, I like how it put here. It said, obviously, of those who are husband and wife, will they have no uh, special relationship? We are told that we're not told enough. We don't know that. So, but basically, we do know that it is a different life than here, and the type of relationship that we have here on earth will be different when we get to heaven. So basically it's still just that, that open faith and that understanding. But I also like how he brought out basically that we will know, we'll know our family. Cause I know we love to speak, you know, I'll see my mom, I'll see my dad or whoever mm -hmm. has gone on with us. And that piece in Luke definitely gives us that hope. Remember when we, we see that with that rich man, basically, hey, go back to my family, tell yeah. him, you know what I mean? Yeah. So we, we see that piece of it. So I definitely, uh, definitely like, uh, like that bit. Like I said, there are some things we don't know. We can, you know, debate and people can try to put it in, but that's why it's called faith. You know, we know that God is going to set, has something set there that is truly for our good. Amen. Amen. All right. And this is right here. We'll pretty much end on this page of commentary, but will someone please uh, read that for us coming from Enduring Word? If it seems that life, if if it seems that life and the resurrection that Jesus spoke of here does not include some of the pleasures of life we know on earth, it is only because the enjoyments and satisfactions of heaven far surpass what we know on earth. We can't be com we can't be completely certain what life what life and glory beyond will be like, but we can know with certainty that no one will be disappointed with the arrangements. Revelation 22, 1, 5. Are like the angels of God in heaven. Jesus here said that the angels of God in heaven do not marry. We presume this includes that they do not have sexual relationships. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I love uh, that piece that Sister Sydney just read, which kind of brings it home. It basically says, we don't know. But we can be certain that nobody's going to be disappointed with the arrangements. Right. <laughs> Amen. 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 Right. I Amen. love that. I truly love that. Because yeah, that is so right. You know, when yes. you say, oh, well, what is it? Is it? No. We know that God has something better for us. Right. So obviously, yeah. we're ending with this. But I just wanted to catch on this last piece. And just wanted to kind of throw a question out. Because it says, obviously, that angel in heaven, they don't marry. So we know angels don't marry. So we're presuming that they do not have sexual relationships, but we see in the old, the, 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 not the Old Testament, actually a uh, discussion of a group of people called the Nilophim. Does anyone remember yeah. them at all? They were yeah. giants. And who were their parents? Fallen angels. angels. Fallen angels. angels. And of course, the, they said the daughters of men. So we basically see that. So just want to kind of bring that out. It's not like, I, it's that's, that the setup is there in heaven that they do not marry. But obviously we see those fallen angels obviously took wives of women. So there are unique idiosyncrasies. So just wanted to bring it totally in context. Amen. All right. Any, any questions, any comments, any thoughts? All right. <laughs> There was everything clear, I guess. Every, it made me. Yes. Good yeah. work. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Perfect, perfect. All righty. Well, could I tap? Let us see. Let us see. Sister Pat, would you like to pray us Amen. out tonight, please? Amen. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> 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 oh, goodness. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Ooh, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy yes, kingdom Lord. come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together tonight for this Bible study. And I pray that um, you will continue to watch over all of us and continue to uh, lead and guide and protect us and keep us safe from all hurt, harm, and danger. Father God, in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Uh, it is Amen. Always good to see each and every one of you. Always good to talk about Jesus. It just gets better and better. You know what yes, I mean? It does. Yes, it does. It does. Amen. So much more because I didn't 
realize all of these questions that they presented to him. You know, it just really was a good good study for me and just to kind of show how Jesus just handled them, you know. <laughs> so <it> was, <laughs> man, man. <laughs> like, like, Sister Sydney, hello, hello. And we always love Hi. to see you. Hi, <laughs> Sister Sydney and London. Hello. hello. Yeah. Good deal indeed. Good to see you this evening too. So just hope everyone has good a to wonderful see day. Too. Uh, and uh, you, oh, well, curious, Sister Cindy, how's the weather up there? Yeah, oh. <laughs> tomorrow's, tomorrow's supposed to be 60. Oh, okay. Friday, gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Okay, that's cool. You need right. it because it's been cold. <laughs> I'm with you, yeah, I'm with you on that. I, I don't want to even say how cold it's been here because we put on big jackets at like 40, right? <laughs> that's yeah. right. Oh, no, it's just right. at 40, the boots come out. The boots. <laughs> We've been like 12 and 13. So. Uh, <laughs> man, I, I, I can't even remember those ages, let alone being those two. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's been bad, but oh, we made it through, so. Yeah, I to totally understand. Oh, yeah. To God be the glory. It's always Amen. good to see you. Have yeah. a wonderful yeah. evening, everyone, and uh, we will see you next time. God bless. Right. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.